of the sublime port, the land of the Ottoman, of honey and tea alike. Or at least, it used to be. Once upon a time, we used to rule these seas to make those pompous Europeans shiver when hearing the name Suleiman. Suleiman. Even the whisper made those dogs in Vienna cower behind their walls. But that was before. Our dear Sultan Mustafa II remains fairly young and still lusting for revenge after the loss of Hungary in the north. And even though the empire's population remains docile and happy, things may quickly change. Christians in the western provinces could become disloyal after all, especially with Austrian or Polish influence. That is of course another thing. We do find ourselves quite surrounded here. The port's stated goal? To retake our lands in Serbia, Hungary and Transylvania. The Austrians would no doubt seek to expand in the Balkans as well. And Venice is proving to be a nuisance in Greece. To the north the Russians may be up to something, as they usually are. And our Persian brothers in the east, well, they might someday soon come to see our lands as theirs, as families often do. In an age where our mighty army is made up of irregular infantry, this could be bad. As always, preparations for our integrity and survival must be made, and fast. And lucky for us, Mustafa knows where to begin, at home. And by the way, while I have you here, only 6% of you watching this video are subscribed to the channel. If you enjoy my content guys, it would just mean so much to me if you took the time to make a simple click and sub to the channel. It goes a long way in helping my content reach further, and hopefully also help you in knowing when there's new content to be enjoyed. I'd really appreciate it. Alright, the Ottoman government is to put it mildly f***ing incompetent. The Grand Vizier and the Treasurer are embezzling funds and spending too much time in the harem, and so heads have no choice but to roll this day. No experience is better than pure misconduct after all, and hopefully our new public servants do well to remember their place. But Mustafa is not just a wise government leader, no, he is also a builder. He knows that the border provinces must be secured and reinforced. Racing administrative centers will be vital to keep the local population in check. And grand roads must be built or armies may arrive at the front as if Shaitan himself was tailing them. That will likely be vital, as the quality of our local forces are less than ideal. Of course, to make things easier in the long run, there is the urgent need to catch up with western technology, and even though Mustafa loves his sports, we must sometimes look to the nerds for help. There is just no way we could come up with the idea of a ring bayonet otherwise. I mean, it's just a bloody ring, but still. In Mesopotamia, the general of our eastern forces made the wise choice of establishing a fort in the mountain range bordering Persia, for an added sense of safety. Nothing says Salam Aleikum Habibi like a high ground mountain fort armed to the teeth, after all. Of course, Mustafa is no diplomatic illiterate either. To safeguard his position, he signed a trade agreement with the Polish, seeking to stave off an incursion from the north in the near future and preventing a possible two-front war should the Austrians attack. Knowing Russia was at war with Sweden was no bad news either. Leave some for us, Mustafa thought, as he sharpened his walking stick for… reasons. He is, after all, only 36 years old. The Sultan also allied the Mughal Empire in an attempt to prevent the Persians from getting any ideas, lest they be surrounded. Trading with the British and their colonies might have been going too far in causing up with future uppity imperial powers, but then again, no leader is without fault, not even Der Mustafa. With a web of tight-knit alliances and trading partners, Mustafa had ensured- Oh wait, come on! Really? Astaghfirullah! Let me just rewrite history for a moment. With literally every neighbor suddenly rabid for his demise, Mustafa was suddenly up against it and deeper in shit than he had ever thought possible. Luckily, his foresight proved invaluable. A newly trained professional army in Istanbul marched north, on the newly constructed Ottoman highway might I add, I mean might the Sultan add, and in Transylvania, the Austrians are about to feel the full might of a relatively weak Ottoman force. At the beginning, the Austrians had the upper hand, positioned as they were on a hillside with the Ottoman soldiers for some reason unable to climb a minor hill. Some men died on the way from cannon fire, as is tradition, but once in range, the full force of our light infantry made themselves known. We shot them, and they shot back. Everyone lined up nice and orderly, as is tradition, but even though the Austrians had cannons, we had cavalry, taking them completely by surprise. Yeah! 
soon the Austrian carpet was rolled up nice and neatly, and we even sent their commander to his maker. And I'm not talking about creative assembly here. The battle was won, General Abbas was mentioned in a few dispatches, and the road towards Transylvania laid open. A second battle ensued with similar results. Two lines met meeting each other, they with cannons, Abbas with his cavalry. The Austrian garrison did not last long, ran prematurely, and left us hanging out to dry until a last cavalry charge sealed the region's fate. Transylvania was once more in the hands of the Empire. In the east, General Baltaki abandoned his fort and hurried north in the hopes of reaching Yerevan before the Georgian horde could descend upon the city. His hopes were crushed after a failed assassination attempt on the Georgian general prompted him to move even faster. The battle for Yerevan was fought at night. Neither our poorly trained militia nor our old-fashioned cannons could stop their cavalry, and the Ottoman and Otto women were soon overrun, and the city lost. General Baltaki was forced to pragmatism, tactically retreating in order to link up with forces from Mesopotamia. It was indeed pragmatism which brought Sultan Mustafa to accept a military alliance with the Maharatha Confederacy for a pouch of gold and to see trade with the Prussians, who now were at war with Poland and Lithuania. Enemies of our enemies and all of that, you know. Sadly, the Prussians are as traitorous as the rest of them. In Armenia, Baltaki had no choice but to wait for the Georgians to meet him on the open field sooner than he'd like, where their cavalry was sure to give them an upper hand. But Baltaki knows battle. He assumed his defenses on the high ground, showering his enemies with bullet rains and cannon fire. And before long, a heroic victory was achieved even here, turning the tide in the Georgian War. Yerevan laid open, and the city was liberated. In Hungary, our fortunes were unsure at best. In a most despicable event, an assassin murdered our general, forcing us to enlist a new, yet skilled commander of our western armies. What he could not have foreseen was that the bulk of the Austrian army laid in wait in Hungary, ready to strike at any moment. Our general therefore made a new gambit. He went east, linked with battalions from Transylvania and opted instead to take out the smaller force first. It was the perfect testing ground for the new Ottoman organ cannons, an absolutely devastating weapon in the field. The Austrians did admittedly fight bravely, but in the end, all became as God willed it. As it turned out though, a second Austrian army had hit the field, and even though a friendly force was on its way to Serbia, it was too far away. It was up to our main force once again to prepare for a fight, as the largest battle of the war so far was about to take place. The Serbian countryside is beautiful this time of year, our general thought. Smoke-filled air, fresh trampled earth, good opportunities to fight in the shade, transport can be a tad dodgy I suppose, and good, fertile soil. After routing the Austrians, we did our best to run them down, but the stragglers escaped further into Serbia, heralding another future skirmish. Hmm, I wonder where this little Venetian combined arms navy and army are headed. Meanwhile, we caught the Austrians in the woods and defeated them again, forcing them to do nothing but harass our countryside. 
two regiments were immediately sent from Athens to deal with them. Clearly on the offensive now, nothing could stop Sultan Mustaf. Wait. In a showing so backstabby even for the lowest Italian rake, the Venetians decided to strike the Crimean Khanate, our vassals. This Mustafa would not let stand, but Venice acted quickly and attacked Athens. With two less vital regiments than just a few months before, Athens was left almost defenseless. It was a foggy day that day. Cannons set up shop, murdering other cannons, and even though Mustafa was about to emerge victorious, his computer crashed in the heat of battle. Instead of cheesing the Venetians, he decided to let fortune decide his outcome. And even though the Venetians can't fight for shit, their overwhelming numbers could not be stopped this time. Athens fell, and so did Crimea, both in one fell swoop. Now this Mustafa II had not expected. With Athens gone and a vital Palestinian port blockaded, the empire lost vital routes for its tax base and income. Not only that, Venice had opened up another front, forcing us to fight in the north, west, and the east, with the south remaining our only peaceful corner. For now, at least. General Las Baghdadi had no choice but to move south, and in a twisted turn of fate, Venice had prevented Hungary from coming home to the Ottoman family. Things could not possibly get any worse, blah, 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 but things were about to take a turn for the worse. On the eastern front, Persia finally made its appearance. But instead of marching on Baghdad, it made its way towards the army in Yerevan. General Baltaki knew he was at number. Finding a good position, he knew his chances for survival the next day remained low. For a good time, victory seemed near. But the Persian army, twice his own size, made itself heard. And in the end, both Baltaki and his men were overrun. Armenia was lost. If you were Mustafa II, what would you do? The wealthy lands of Greece are lost. The Venetians also rule on Crimea. No powerful Ottoman army is standing strong in the east, where both the Persians and the Georgians are sending you truly the most awful vibes. You have the Austrians sort of where you want them, but I have no idea whatsoever what to do with the Polish and Russians. Your population is now truly beginning to feel the cost of war, as taxation is rising to pay for new uniforms, and growth is stagnating as more and more men are leaving your cities and towns to join the front. Now a thinking man might sue for peace, cut your losses, and rebuild in order to come back stronger later. But there's a reason it's called the Auto Man, not Auto Baby, and Mustafa knows this all too well. No, Mustafa wouldn't sue for peace. Not now, not when all but a sliver of hope is lost, not when all the world is stacked against him. He ordered General Las Baghdadi towards Athens immediately. The rapid assault took the Venetians by surprise, resulting in a major victory. That same week, the army moved west for Patras, putting our formidable force against the Venetian garrison, with no chance of winning. In one fell swoop, Las Baghdadi had retaken not just Athens, but all of Greece for the empire. In the north, Mustafa ordered local captains to take matters into their own hands, but he had no idea how successful they would be. Sending a small force into Croatia under the cover of night, a no-name captain took the Zagreb garrison completely unawares, and the city fell to us that very day. In a masterstroke, Mustafa had secured the western front and had taken us back to the borders of Austria and Vienna itself. Nearby, a detachment was sent to read the all-important Austrian port of Trieste, leading to the first naval battle of the war. The Ottoman fleet met the Austrian under the burning sun and violent waves that day.
the roar of cannons could be heard from miles away. And even though the Austrian fleet sank quick enough, Venice had sent reinforcements to aid Austria. In a battle that would last a full day, the ships sent their deadly cannonballs back and forth. Venice even attempted to board our ship, meeting us with sword in hand, but ultimately lost and its men were forced to walk the plank. Nothing could stop our overwhelming navy that day, and the battle, which destroyed the Austrian fleet and the northern Venetian navy, even led to our sacking the very port of Venice itself. We had secured massive and vital victories, but the tide of the war still hang in the balance, for the real weight of Austria's armies laid in wait in Hungary. In Austria's first forceful attack, it approached undefended Belgrade and seized the city, causing untold human suffering. In the east, Persia sent another horde towards our front, attacking Baghdad. But here, our brave defenders stood firm, sending the bastards back from whence they came. Meanwhile, in the first of such offenses in the war, Poland-Lithuania saw its chance to invade Transylvania, but General Abbas would not have it. The defense of Clausenburg took place outside the city. In this hilly and mountainous landscape, grand armies were no use. Utilizing his knowledge of the field, Abbas sent his men forward in a rush to be the first to occupy the high ground. And so he did. Not native to this land, the Poles simply waited for his attackers. And then they heard it. The organ guns. It caught the Poles completely unawares, and when our lines opened fire from above, the battle was already over. From that day on, the organ guns were simply known by one name, the Abbas organ. Clausenburg was saved, and the Polish army suffered a crushing first defeat. Of course, Abbas wasn't done. He moved once and for all to crush Austria's largest army led by the prince himself. This was another mountainous battle. The Austrians were admittedly better prepared than the Polish, having set up the defenses before battle. It mattered little. With the prince dead, the remnants of the army fled to a nearby church. But Abbas did not care. He followed them further into Hungary, now in control of several towns and, for the first time, he could smell the city he swore. His victory meant that the Austrian armies in Serbia were close to being cut off, with General Baghdadi biding his time a few days march south. To make matters worse for the Austrians, Sultan Mustafa ordered raiding parties to pillage the countryside outside Vienna, cutting them off even further from their riches. In Baghdad, a new general, the Kurdish Taufik quickly rose through the ranks after distinguishing himself against the Persians. And more was in store. He ran them away from the farms of Kirkuk and retook the Grand Fortress in the mountains, before he was ultimately forced to retreat to Baghdad once more, when the news of a grand new Persian army arrived. But in the west, this was the year of the true turning of the tides. The Austrians took to pillaging our countryside now, but in doing so scattered its armies. This allowed both Abbas and Baghdadi to make their moves. Serbia was reconquered, while Bosnia was lost, then retaken. By the end of it, every single Austrian army had retreated to or around Vienna, and there were no hostile armies to be seen south of Budapest. Mustafa now ordered one army to reinforce Transylvania against possible Polish-Lithuanian attacks. After replenishing their armies and receiving fresh recruits from Istanbul, we finally had the Austrians in a chokehold. In Croatia, Baghdadi could reach Hungary within a week. And from within the province itself, Abbas had the region capital in his sights. This was the moment. Abbas launched the invasion, taking the star fort outside the city first, before moving to besiege it. 
From the south, Baghdadi joined the campaign, fought and won battles on the way, and in a moment that hadn't happened for 20 years, Ottoman troops were once again at the walls of Vienna. Much had led up to this moment. One single tear fell from the eye of the Sultan as he heard the news, but the men were not ready for battle. Reinforcements were needed, and we would have received them too, if it weren't for those pesky small Austrian relief forces. Perhaps this was the day after all. The Battle of the Fields of Vienna had begun. It seemed like any other battle at the beginning, but Baghdadi soon realized that his reinforcements wouldn't make it. Faced with being attacked from two sides, he rapidly ordered his men to finish up the initial batch first. Utilizing his classic cavalry charges, he routed the enemy. A massive exchange of fire ensued, but our flank and rear were secured. Baghdadi had once again led our Ottoman Empire to victory. With Abbas' army firmly in Viennese territory, the final battle closed in after a long siege. Of course, this was mostly a formality really. The Austrians had barely a garrison left, but after so many battles and backs and forths, it was at least touching that Baghdadi and Abbas finally met on the field of battle. And with that, we had not only reconquered old Ottoman European territory, but even taken the jewel in the Austrian crown. Vienna itself. Sultan Mustafa could sleep soundly. Holy shit! I really thought things would go south there for a moment. First of all guys, thank you so much for watching. This is a new concept I'm trying out, so if you enjoyed the video, please please leave a comment and let me know your thoughts. And as always, like the video and sub to the channel. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time. Cheers!